Julie Smith. I'm the executive director of Elementary Literacy, which is a nonprofit in New Brunswick, Canada. Our mission is to help struggling readers in early elementary learn to read by matching them with volunteers. Today, we're gonna to talk about that space, the early literacy space, but not so much the specifics, more the bigger lessons we can learn, both about equality, but also policy issues. It's a very interesting field. It's a place where there have been struggles in the English speaking world for the past 30 years. Literacy is a massive challenge. In Canada, for example, more than half of adults are not functionally literate. The same is true in the United States. In Australia, the number is closer to a third. And when I first started this job, my thought was, well, those must be the older adults, but that's not in fact the case. One third of children in the school system in Canada struggle. They do not read a grade level. And this is not a new problem. It's actually been for decades. What's interesting is that it's a problem that people have recognized. Different governments of different political stripes have prioritized, have invested in. Nonprofits have worked on this. The private sector have worked on this. Governments have put money. Teachers have put their heart and souls in this. And it didn't really move for a really long time. But something happened not so long ago. And what happened was that certain jurisdictions started listening to a pretty strong body of research. And that started mostly in the UK, uh, Australia followed suit, and some American jurisdictions have come behind. But there remains something in the English speaking world, which is called the reading wars, where there are two pedagogies, one, with a very solid evidence base behind it. 30 years of research, though not in the field of education, mostly in neuroscience and psychology. And a, another pedagogy called balanced literacy that evolved out of a belief called fold language that reading was natural and that it would come very simply. Those two thought processes, schools of thoughts and pedagogies have permeated throughout different places and have influenced how reading is taught. Balanced literacy was by far the predominant approach in North America and frankly across most of the English speaking world until very recently. And numbers didn't move. So what we're going to talk about today is even though as we learned more about the brain through advancements in MRIs and through research studies and through a growing body of research, that was all ignored until recently. And those high yield practices that have been studied have started being put into place. And we're going to talk about what's actually happening and how all of that can be applied to other policy questions. So with that lead up, we're going to move on and we're going to start looking at our slides. So I'm gonna stop for a minute on this one because we are here talking about equalities this week. So in the SDGs, number four is quality education. And what's interesting here, as I had already said, is that education is believed to be the great leveler. It is the thing that is believed to create social mobility, to allow people to move beyond the situation they were born in. What is fascinating is that the research that comes out of the last 30 years in the reading realm is that that alone isn't enough. A lot of children go to school 
a lot of children finish school. But without the quality side, those children actually fall further and further behind. And in adulthood, they continue to suffer. So the emphasis needs to be on that quality component, not just the education. So why is literacy important? Some of it is so self-evident. We walk around and we see words everywhere. And in the computer world, that's even more obvious. But it goes even further than that. Literacy is a precursor to so many determinants of health and happiness. Low literacy makes you much more likely to commit suicide. It makes it so you have a significantly lower life expectancy. It makes it much more likely that you will die of an accident. It makes it much more likely that you will have mental health issues. It also makes it much more likely that you'll have poor health outcomes, that you will live in poverty, and it can often be intergenerational. You have a higher likelihood of incarceration. Literacy is one of the key components to adult success. But literacy doesn't start where we think it does. Literacy actually starts basically with crawling around that time, around 18 months. So when we think about a child learning to read, and we think that's starting when they're seven or eight, that's in fact pretty late. That's the end of the hard reading journey. In fact, seven-year-olds are going through a process normally that's very similar to law school in terms of the amount of learning that they were doing as a reader. And that is combining years and years of learning that they started to do when they were about 18 months old. Their pre-literacy readiness, that learning that they do between 18 months and about five years of age, is a predictor of their early literacy success. So if they're behind when they start school, it is likely that they're gonna be behind when they finish whatever grade they're in, in their system when they're eight or nine. That is a predictor of their adult literacy. And that is a predictor of their adult success. So that means that getting it right when a child is zero to eight is almost essential to their adult success. Of course, there are interventions. Of course, there are exemptions. Of course, there are ways that we can help, but it becomes harder. It becomes more resource intensive and it becomes less likely to succeed the further you move along that pathway. So let's talk about how that links to inequality. So I mentioned that we have here in Canada, about half of our adults who can't read and about 30% of school children who struggle to read. Those 30% are of course not across the board. And who it actually is, is actually different country by country because it's basically your children with learning disabilities plus you're historically disadvantaged in your own context. So in, in most countries, it will include ruralness and it will include some context of poverty, but that poverty context can actually be different. So for example, in the United States where there is differential funding models for school, your community can actually play a a larger role than it does in a community, in a country where that is less a model that's used for how school is funded, for example. But what we do see is that it is always the historically disadvantaged who are overrepresented in those kids who can't read. 
so we will talk about a few countries. So in Australia, there was a report that recently came out in 2020 that highlighted that the children who struggle the most are Aboriginal children, remote children, and children in disadvantaged neighborhoods. In the United States, most often what's highlighted is Black children, Hispanic children, and children from low socioeconomic backgrounds. In Canada, we don't keep demographics like this exactly. Um, we do know that Indigenous children are behind. We also know from a study in Toronto that at least in that context, that Black children are behind. We can extrapolate that that's likely true across the country, but we don't actually keep those statistics. We also know that children with learning dis disabilities in Canada are quite behind. For example, in Ontario at the grade three level, 53% of children with known learning disabilities do not meet the grade three level. And you may think, well, of course, but it is actually not inevitable that having a learning disability, even one like dyslexia that's about reading, um, it, it is not inevitable that that means that you can't read by the end of grade three. Actually, dyslexia is quite easy in a sense to overcome. It, it requires effort, it requires uh, knowledge, and it requires persistence, but it is possible to have a dyslexic child reading at grade level at the appropriate time. And actually we'll go back for one second. So the point of this graph is that unlike the myth of the great leveler of our education system, regardless of who makes up your disadvantaged groups in your particular country, what always happens when you study them is that the gap, so if we look at that point where the blue and the red line are touching there, and we'll say that's 18 months where all the children are at the same point, what happens is that when they hit school, it continues to distance, it does not close. The theory was always that school would close that gap, but that is not what was happening. What was happening was the gap continued to widen. And one of the reasons for that, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, is that when the system that's being used in the school isn't adequately, adequately meeting the needs of the kids. The parents of high means, whether that's personally or financially, would supplement outside of the system. So for example, my son has a learning disability. And when he was in high school and elementary school and honestly in middle school, I paid for tutors, I paid for assessments, I paid for summer camps, I paid for private summer school, I paid for books, I paid for workbooks. And not everyone has those means and not everyone knows how to access those things. So you actually see parents of high means creating a way to to compensate if their child is the one the system isn't adequately addressing. Whereas a family where there is any reason why they can't do that, whether it's financial or uh, a lack of time because they're working two jobs or a language barrier or a distrust of institutions because they're historically disadvantaged or they're remote and they can't access services. They don't have those options. And so those children don't end up with that opportunity. So they do not end up learning to read. So they stay in that 30%, whereas the children who have extra resources eventually do learn to read because once you've learned to read, it's done and you can do it. So it's sort of a, 
a easy one for parents to rally around because we know it's important and we just have to do it. And then once it's done, we can move on. So it is something where you really see sort of that subtle privilege behind it because parents or families who have the means, whether it's the parent themselves because they're a teacher or because they're naturally inclined to languages or just have the time and the patience to sit there and, and practice over and over again, or they have the funds to hire people or to buy things, you actually see a cohort being left behind because what's actually teaching the kid to read is not the school, it's all of the extra supports. So we're gonna step back. What does it actually mean to learn to read? And this is sort of the crux of where this, this divide in philosophy and teaching came from. There was a assumption in the 1960s that reading was natural, that like language, it was something we would just acquire that it just came to us, we had to be around it. It would just, it was just there. We just had to want it. We just had to be motivated and we could access it. What we know now that we know so much more about the brain is that is in fact entirely incorrect. Language is in one part of the brain. As you can see here, it is in the frontal lobe. Reading, you will also see here, is in four different parts of the brain. It's quite clumsy. The theory on that is from an evolution perspective, reading is a new process. It's not very old. And so our brains sort of monster mashed it. It's not, it's not something that's been fine tuned. So what our brain has to do for us to read is it has to actually rewire, literally, to attach four different parts of our brain so that four different processes can work together. So putting it another way, it's sort of like driving a standard car. So you need to be able to use the gear shift and the steering wheel, and the clutch, and the brake, and the accelerator, and still look around. And if you can remember doing that the first time, that is not easy. I'm still learning to drive, and it's not easy. I can tell you if you can't remember, not easy. So in that beginning part where it's not a process that has become automatic and fluent, there is a lot of work going on in your brain. And when a brain works, we now know, and when we're learning, what we actually need is repetition. And we need to build things onto pre-existing knowledge so that we build up the skills and the system so that it becomes complete. So that's how the brain works, but what is reading? So I talked about it being like driving a car. So what are those pieces? So if you think about it, you're looking at a letter, you need to know there's a symbol and you're associating it with a sound, which you're associating it with a word. And that word has been given meaning through oral language that you've learned like when you are with a baby and you say hot and spoon, and then that is combined with being able to give a structure to a sentence so that you understand it in a context. And then you have to put that into meaning, into a background knowledge. So if you look at this, this is a common way of explaining it. 
what a small child is doing when we're talking in the five to eight year old range is they're taking these different pieces and they're intertwining them like a rope. So on the language comprehension side, which is where it actually mostly starts because that's where your oral language is. So when you're talking to a baby and you're, you know, you start with baby sounds and then you move to a word, you're starting over there and you're teaching them about the world. You're actually building their pre-literacy skills. So language comprehension is about background knowledge, about understanding, because reading is about meaning. So I have recently been reading COVID science papers. The first one I read in 2020 had no meaning. I didn't understand any of those words. I am not a scientist. So it took me forever because I had to go use a dictionary and read other things to give meaning to all the words because I could decode the words, I could say them, but I did not understand it. So we need a background knowledge to apply these sounds and these concepts to. So we need vocabulary, we need to understand the words. We need the language structure, we need to understand that a, a sentence is different from a question. We need to understand how the language functions. We need to understand, you know, how words are ordered in a sentence. We need verbal reasoning. We need knowledge of literacy. And we take those and then at, in a different bucket, we need to recognize words. So they're almost starting on a separate path. So for word recognition, we need phonological awareness, which is just a really big word way of saying we understand that words have sounds that they have syllables, that they can rhyme, that they break up into sounds and that sometimes we blend those sounds together and sometimes we pull them apart and sometimes it'll sound different when you move it in the word. So that's what phonological awareness is, is our awareness that the letter as represented by a symbol is going to be that sound is going to change and that that our sounds are in structures then we have decoding which is actually understanding the code and this part is a lot like math so decoding knowing that those symbols add up to all of those things you need to start at the basics like you don't start at calculus you start at basic adding and subtracting so when you start with decoding you need to start with just a few letters and just simple words and then move up to complicated words with latin roots and greek roots and things like that so your, your decoding is understanding it's a literal code you're cracking. And once you've cracked it, you can read any word and you can start discerning meaning of it. And that's why you can hit a word in a book that you don't actually know. And often you can figure out what it means. And if you know another language, you can even transfer that to some level. So I speak French to a not embarrassing level and I can read a Spanish word and often because of my decoding skills, I can figure out what that Spanish word is and what it means. And then you have sight recognition. So this is the idea that things become automatic. So the word the, the word of, we don't really read them, even little kids pretty quickly, that we see them so often that eventually they just are, they exist, they are a thing you you have it memorized so you just keep going so what happens is it's 
very clumsy in the beginning. If you've ever watched a small child learn to read, it's so clumsy. They're, they're really struggling. They're really tired. And they're really trying to put it all together. It's basically me driving a standard car or a motorcycle, which I did recently. And that was even worse. So what that looks like is pretty sloppy. But as they practice and start building more skills, it tightens up and it starts intertwining. And then as you add more, it gets tighter and tighter. And once they become more fluent, then they start getting a lot more meaning out of it. And then they start getting more comprehension. And then that's when they become a skilled reader. So this is the one where the pedagogy becomes really important. So that's, that's how the brain works. That's how reading works. But this is how statistically people learn to read. So one of the arguments for balanced literacy was always the kids who just learn to read. We all know them. My boyfriend is one of them. I have a friend who could read up three. It's true. 5% of people appear to just know how to read and nobody knows why. But they're essentially the reading equivalent of a musician who just knows how to play an instrument. Those, those amazing people who have so much more musical talent than I do, who can pick something up and just play it. Nobody knows why, but it exists. It's effortless or almost effortless. They may need some basic guidance. They may get stuck every once in a while, but really they're not really taught to read. They just seem to know. So those are the kids that the other theory was built around, but they're 5%. There's 35% who don't need a lot. They need some broad instruction. If, if you get them a little bit, if you give them some here, give them some there, they're probably going to figure it out. It might be a little bit slower. They maybe won't be the best reader they're ever going to be. They maybe won't love it because it'll be more of a struggle than it could have been, but they are going to learn to read with relative ease. So there you have 40% of readers, no matter what method you use. So there, 40% success, no matter what. Remember, we have 30% who can't learn to read. So 40% for sure. We have 70% who can. Then we get into the other people. So 40 to 50% need explicit instruction. And what that means is they need to actually be taught directly. It can't be subtle. It can't be exploratory. It can't be a one-off. It can't be ad hoc. It needs to be planned. It needs to be structured. It needs to be intentional. It needs to be repetitive. And it needs to follow a sensible sequence that's foundational to difficult. And without that, they're likely not going to become strong readers. Then you have the last group, which are mostly kids with dyslexia. There are, there are a few other people that's probably a bit too narrow, but we'll leave it at that, kids with dyslexia. And without repeated, explicit, systematic uh, instruction, they will never learn to read, but they can. And that is all that they need. They don't actually need a special intervention. They don't need a later intervention. What they need is early explicit teaching methods. And what's really interesting with dyslexia is one of the key differences is just the number of repetitions. So for a, a normal, sorry, not normal, a, for a, 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 standard reader to, to internalize the process, it's five repetitions. Um, for a dyslexic reader, 
it's 25. So they really need that instruction and they need it to be structured and reliable and consistent and on a plan. So if you had a lesson on the letter A and they hadn't got A and you've already jumped to B, even if you do A in three weeks, you've lost them. They needed to do A until they didn't need to do A anymore. So this is a really important component of how reading works. This is just a quick quote. Um, it is from the Ontario Right to Read Inquiry. The public school refused to acknowledge or accept the dyslexia diagnosis until she was seven. Without timely remediation, my daughter is barely able to read and write in English as she enters grade three. In the meantime, her mental health is strained because she is keenly aware of her learning differences and extremely frustrated by the fact that she struggles to read and write. Last year, she asked Santa for the power to read. She's still wondering if she's ever going to get her wish. These children don't just feel their struggles in reading. The mental health impacts of watching all of the other kids in the class learn to read, they know how important it is. It is devastating. The, the likelihood of them being diagnosed with something like depression or anxiety, even as a small child, is extremely high. They put a lot of pressure on themselves. And the fact that they're in a method that generally leaves them to teach themselves makes them feel even more anxiety. So I've sort of alluded to the two methods. And so that was that's sort of the science basis. But we're going to go into them in a little bit more detail. So balanced literacy, which was the predominant and is still predominant in most of North America and a number of other countries, such as New Zealand, it doesn't ignore the fact that you need to learn the structure of language and that you need to learn the sounds and the code, but it doesn't teach it explicitly. It, it spends a lot of time with children doing things like what they call guided readings and, and, and groups and spending a lot of time with books by themselves. And, and so you're not ever taught it as a foundational learning skill. It focuses a lot on memorization. And that is interesting because it works in the early years. But the problem is that we actually have a cap to our memory capacity. And once you get to grades four, which is about a 10 year old um, and above, the demands become such that your working memory is not capable of keeping all those words in your memory anymore. You actually need the tools and skills to decode to be able to access so much more. Being able to access only what's in your memory is not sufficient anymore. You also are taught to use something that's called three queuing. And three queuing is essentially a system to guess rather than read. So what you are taught is to take your context from everything surrounding the words rather than focusing on the words. Or you may focus on the words, but not the words you're actually reading. So you would look at the picture, you would listen to the sentences around it. And rather than trying to tackle the word you're reading, you would use those things to guess. And this can be highly problematic. And the, the key example that's often used, because it's very dramatic, um, is of a book where there is a sentence that some, says something like, yesterday, Jane got to ride a, and there is a word, and there is a picture of a horse. 
and the child says pony. So the word pony doesn't have the same letter word, uh, the same number of letters. It doesn't have the same number of syllables. None of the letters are the same. There is nothing right about that guess from a word reading perspective. And the teacher would say, oh, that's right, because in context, it made sense. That is extremely problematic. And it's problematic for a number of reasons. One, the encouragement of children to guess actually masks real problems in reading. So children who are actually appearing to be good readers in those early years are often just very skilled guessers. And they'll hit higher grades where teachers are not well equipped to teach you to read and they can't read at all. That's a problem. But the second problem, which relates more to my horse pony example, is that they, in those instances, are actually having their code undermined because rather than look at that word and learn how to internalize it, they're looking at something and being told it has a totally different meaning than it actually has. So their brain would be completely confused if they were close to getting a code. So if they actually knew that pony went puh, then their brain would have a really mixed signal on how to decode words. This is a huge problem. So we also see out of this that you will see children who do well on standardized tests in those very, very early years and the next standardized test, they do poorly because those guessing skills are artificially inflating those early test scores. So the other part of this is that the theory is that children will get better at reading by reading and that the point of the reading as instruction is for children to love reading, not to actually teach them. And there are some issues with this because it, it has some flawed assumptions. Because a child who's struggling, who is supposed to sit behind a book that they cannot access, knowing full well that they can't read it while their peers are reading, actually just sits there in self-loathing and anxiety. They are not getting anything out of that experience. And that's not going to make them love reading. It actually gives them a huge aversion. This is why a lot of adults don't like to read who come out of the system. It, it, they, they still have aversions from those sort of experiences. But you don't actually get better by reading more. You get better by being instructed and practicing. So structured literacy, which is a, a system that comes out of the high yield practices that have studied how children actually learn to read, which is really quite simple. It is just actually teach the skills that are necessary, use repetition and use a building blocks approach um, for the most part. It, that's simply all it is. And, and this, this particular slide, if you've been reading it, it focuses quite heavily on the decoding side of it, but it also applies to the vocabulary side. You use very similar um, methods. So if you want to teach vocabulary, you also need to be explicit. You need to actually teach rather than exposing children. You need to use repetition. You need to use scaffolding, meaning that you start at the most basic and you add complexity as you go. You need to use as much repetition as a child needs to get what they need as their base skills before you add more complex skills. And if you are doing those things, then the child is more likely to get the skills they need. You also have the child access books that they can read themselves. So you use something called a decodable reader, which means simply that the letters that are used in it are letters that they have been taught how to read. So 
a predictive tax, which is often the other kind that's used, will have repetitive sentences that they can memorize. I really like ice cream. I really like chips. I really like, this would be a really unhealthy book, but you get the idea. But eventually they will just know the beginning of the sentences I really like. They're not really reading that, they're remembering it. But with a decodable reader, you would only make words that use letters you've taught. So those are the two systems. So then the question is, what happened when the high yield practices that came out of this research were put into practice? And it's actually quite interesting. So as I said, the UK started and with the UK, they started with the um, phonics screener in grade one and they recently finished a longitudinal study where they have demonstrated that it has improved grade six reading. And that may seem sim like a not a very grand thing, but the, the point always is to have long-term trajectory changes. So the fact that if you do a screener in grade one that looks at these base skills and work on those skills, and that has ability to influence the ability to read complex texts in grade six, that is actually extremely important. And as a high yield practice, extremely implementable. It is something that teachers can do, something systems can do that we can know is going to improve those outcomes with times and with cohorts. Another interesting study that came out recently was in South Australia, where they put in a, phonic, a phonics screener and they implemented first in 2018. So they have their second year of data. And between year one and two, they saw an 11 point increase, which is a pretty good increase for one year. But going to that inequalities point where explicit instruction is, is failing the kids who don't have the resources to be taught outside of the system, there were gains of significantly more among children with learning disabilities, children with um, from remote areas and children who were from disadvantaged schools. So they had gains above those 11 points, demonstrating that using this explicit method is very beneficial for children who are from a disadvantaged background. But the case study that is used as the best example is Mississippi. So Mississippi in 2013 put in a law as a starting point that completely changed how they approached reading. But they followed through that law with policy changes and very importantly with significant professional development and resources to support the teachers. So they did a full system overhaul. And they have gone from in 2013, the 49th out of 50th state in reading scores for fourth grade to the 29th, middle of the pack. And middle of the pack, most people would say, well, that's not that great. But to go from basically the bottom to the average in less than 10 years is remarkable. And what keeps looking remarkable is that when you break it down by other groups, the gap between black students and white students is closing. Not as dramatically as a lot of people would like to see because I'm not gonna pretend that this is the silver bullet because inequalities are so complex. It's, it's not going to, it's not a cure all but it is something that can make a huge difference. So it has closed five points um, over that time period. And interestingly, Black and Hispanic students in Mississippi now have the strongest 
results in the United States when compared to their peers. So meaning that the, the black and his, the black students of Mississippi are the strongest readers when compared to other black readers in the United States and the same for the Hispanic readers when compared to Hispanic readers. So the point being that this system has demonstrated that it has value in really making a difference for those groups that have historically been left behind by systems. And one thing that I find really interesting in this world is often in the balanced literacy world, there is a lot of energy placed on if only the parents. And it's almost a deficit model that if only the parents read to them more, if only the parents were around for them more, if only the parents had more books at home, if only the parents, and don't get me wrong, those things are 100% important. They are, sing to your kids, read to your kids, definitely important, definitely make a difference. But what's interesting is that it took the focus off of the fact that the children were not being taught to read at school. It put the focus for that failure on the parents. And that narrative is extremely interesting, given that when structured literacy is applied, those same kids with the parents presumably acting in exactly the same way are learning to read at a rate that is much more successful. So I'm sure that's all interesting, but you're wondering what on earth that has to do with your work. So the reason why I thought this was an interesting story to tell and an important thing to think about is I've worked on a lot of policy issues and I found this one and the dance around the evidence base really quite telling. And what I find interesting about it is there are some really big lessons that can be brought to basically any field. And I'm going to, I'm going to elaborate on what those are and you can, you can take them as you wish because they are less evidence-based than the rest of this and are just sort of my reflections, but I, I find it quite interesting. So one really comes out of that last point I made. And I think we should always be cautious when there is a policy that has a clear gap for disadvantaged groups and the narrative is to blame the client. Because often when you scratch under the surface, it isn't all the client or it isn't the client. It is a system failure. And as long as that lens is on, the blame is on the client, you're not looking at the hard evidence that this program you're attached to, this methodology you're attached to, the evidence isn't there. You're basically just looking for a reason to explain why the evidence isn't supporting you. And rather than actually asking the hard questions and really digging into why the thing that you believe is the right thing is consistently failing the same people. So that's the first thing that I feel is a very, very important lesson to take out of this. The second one is just that general culture change challenge. So this is a hard space sometimes because I, I was quite critical of balanced literacy in this, but if you are with me when I'm in my day job, I don't do that. I don't say it like this. And the reason is this. I'm not a teacher. Couldn't teach a kid. Could not teach them to read. No way. Nope. That's hard. That's way harder than anything I can do. And I have a staff who is a teacher. 
or, or who was a teacher. Right now she develops things for me. And when she started reading this stuff one day, she came to me and she said, every time I do one of these courses or read this, I just feel sick to my stomach because I feel responsible for these kids that I failed. And she only taught for five years. So imagine you taught for 20 years like this. You thought it was right. You thought it was best. You loved those kids. You were up all night. You were cutting out stars. You were sticking things to walls. You were doing what teachers do, just wanting to change the world and every one of those kids and wanting them all to be successful. And you, to accept the evidence, have to accept that you failed kids you care about a lot. And that would take, I'm, I'm big on open mindsets and on learning, but that would take a big person and that'd be really hard. And I feel like that's one of the really important things about this is that it's important to have empathy in these conversations and be very careful about the things we say because those teachers were doing their best. They're trying their best. They were told that's what they should do. They were told by their professors. They were told by their departments. They were told by experts. They were told that this is what you did to teach children to read. They, they did nothing wrong. They just weren't given access to the evidence. And of course, a teacher doesn't have time to go do what I do when I have a job that has time for that, where I read academic journals and look at neuroscience and no teacher has time for that. They are, you know, against the wall, they're tying shoes, they're taking off snowsuits if they're in Canada, like that isn't in a teacher's day job. So the culture change part is fascinating because of course, we need teachers to be educated on high yield practices, on what works best, but we need to be oh so careful about how we say it because they're human and they did their best and there's heavy weight to this transition because that evidence is stark and those changes are optimistic moving forward, but for somebody who is 10, 15, 20 years in, it carries past. And that's a really important lesson while you're trying to change things. The next lesson that I really take out of this that I think is really important to policy is that it's not always about more money, more people, more effort, more intention. This is a field full of good intentions, another ribbon cutting, another announcement, another this, another that, another this, another that. It didn't change anything. If you're 15 years into that and nothing changed, that's probably not the answer. I'm not saying don't invest in important things. Of course you should, but make sure you're investing in the right things. And sometimes maybe rather than just investing more in a program that doesn't seem to be doing it, maybe go invest in some, a little bit in some prototype that seems crazy. Maybe that's the answer. Or maybe go pay someone to go figure out if there are other options. Like maybe it isn't just more of the same thing. And that is a really big policy rut because that requires looking at no evidence. It's just putting more into what we're doing. It, it's, you know, one of the classic traps of, of investment, you know, throwing good money after bad. And you need to stop and look at all evidence and not just go, the evidence isn't just this isn't, this isn't working, we need better results. It's the why. Why isn't it working? What isn't working? How isn't it working? The answer is not always, we need more. And you know what, when you have to change the system, you are going to need more, but you need to know who you need, what you need, where you need it, in what way you need it. But just adding more on is not going to fix the problem. And the last one is what you measure. So I talked a few times about the artificially bumped up early grade 
assessments. But the other thing is that one of the big assessments in this field was actually, and I am not making this up, a assessment that was made by a publisher that was created not to measure children, but to sell parents books so that they would know what level their kids book should be at. And it became a standard tool across education systems that was used to grade children. It was not meant to be that. And yet it is what children were measured against. And that particular tool, if you were trying to be a teacher who was using the evidence base would actually penalize you because none of those skills would be measured. It wouldn't show up. It wouldn't show that you were teaching a child to decode. It wouldn't show that that child actually knew how to read because it was based on a flawed methodology. So we need to be extremely careful about what we measure and we need to measure for quality, which is quite hard, but we need to not just measure for quantity, which is very easy. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope that was helpful and gave you something to think about. And I look forward to our live discussion. Thank you very much.